to transform darkness into light. Through the blessings of this glorious Sunday, make us worthy to celebrate the praise you with all those who saw the radiant light of your resurrection. We worship and we thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to the living one who by his death gave life to his creation. By his resurrection he saved his church, gave joy to his flock, brought us back to his Father, and enriched us with the gifts of his Spirit. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Only begotten Son, you were born of the Father before all ages, and by your creative will, you separated light from darkness on this, the first day of the week. You fashioned all creation to honor Adam, the image of your majesty. We praise and we thank you and we celebrate proclaiming. Blessed are you, for you appeared in the flesh on earth like us, and you lived among us. Blessed are you, for you were buried and counted among the dead, and you shined your light in the sadness of the tomb. Blessed are you, for you rose to life, giving hope, good hope to all, and you filled the angels with radiance, and they appeared at your tomb like flashes of lightning. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make us worthy to rejoice in the glory of your radiant resurrection. Breathe life into our departed and make them worthy to stand at your right hand in your eternal light that you have prepared for those who love you. With them we praise and thank you for your graces and glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever.
Accept the fragrance of our incense and of our prayers, and may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord, our God, to you be glory now and forever. Kadi shantalo ho kadi shant hayalantono kadi shant lo with joy from the mountain Sunday is a feast so great offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate Reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, when I came to you proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet. We do speak a wisdom to those who are mature, but not a wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Rather, we speak God's wisdom, mysterious, hidden, which God predetermined before the ages of our glory, for our glory, in which none of the rulers of this age knew, or if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, 
what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. This God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit scrutinizes everything, even the depths of God. Praise be to God always. of the gospel of our Saviour, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint John, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And whoever loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. And Judas, not the Iscariot, said to him, Rabbi, then what has happened that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, Whoever loves me shall keep my word, and my Father shall love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am yet with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have taught you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. This is the truth, peace be with you. And this God has revealed to us through his Spirit. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The word wisdom, chokmah, in the Old Testament, is listed hundreds of times, the notion of wisdom. It has such a central aspect of God's teaching. And dozens of times in the New Testament. But this beginning of the letter to the Corinthians is actually one of the places that contrasts it most clearly of St. Paul between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, the thoughts of God, the thoughts of the world, which echo the Old Testament. They echo the Old Testament when God, through the prophets, speaks to Israel, who Israel goes on doing their things, ignoring God and acting as they wish. That God says to the prophets, he says, because you were not struck down and punished straight away, you thought, in a sense, because you got away with it, you thought that your thoughts were my thoughts and my thoughts were yours. And he says, but this is not at all the case. My thoughts are completely distinct. As heaven is distant from the earth, so my thoughts are different from yours. And he announces it that way, not to say, now I'm going to punish you, but that is part of it. But what he's saying is because you have to understand that the transformation is to think the way that my thoughts, God's thoughts are, and not to try to drag God down to your considerations. This is why St. Paul says in this letter to the Corinthians, he says that if they had known, if they had had wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, Israel and the authorities, the pagans, of course, don't have this wisdom, but even the Sanhedrin, who execute our Lord, he says they do not possess this wisdom of God, and if they had, they would, they would have seen what they were doing, and they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so he's giving a contrast, because the beginning of this letter of Corinth, to the Corinthians Corinth, as we've mentioned numerous times, was a wealthy city. And people who live in wealthy cities get puffed up because of the wealthy city. The same way people think they're smart because they have a computer in their pocket. But they didn't make the computer. They don't make the Wikipedia entrances that are in their pocket. They don't make any of those things. And yet they will think themselves to be smart because I can look it up. And I say, this is total misunderstanding. And so the people in Corinth had the same idea. We're important people. This is a rich city. This is a port city. So this letter actually begins by saying, by St. Paul says, look around you. There's no noble of birth. None of you are wealthy and famous. You're not civic leaders. You're not heroic figures of, of, of Greek culture. And he says, God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the strong. So he already begins the teaching of the thoughts of God in the very first chapter. What we have read today is the beginning of chapter two, in which he talks about this wisdom of the transformation. And the wisdom is basically throughout the teachings of God, throughout the old law, from the Torah, all the way up to the apostles, is a movement from what is external to internal. A transformation of external things and a transformation of internal things. When you look at the word of wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is related to our word that we still have in English, the old Anglo-Saxon word of wits. Have your wits about you. It means be smart, be attentive, right? Well, wisdom is that plane, that, that realm where intelligence and where thinking and reflection functions. That is wisdom and its meaning of the word etymolo etymologically. But wisdom actually winds up meaning that it's more of a definition of precision, as far as the philosophers are concerned, is an ordering of means towards an end. So wisdom requires us to see what is the end and the purpose of what we're doing in this action or in our lives, and then to properly order those means towards the end. That's the simple understanding of wisdom. And there's a wisdom in the world and there's a wisdom of God. But clearly what we are seeing is that ultimately that wisdom of God is to see God as the definitive goal of why we exist. And St. Paul says this is the wisdom that is revealed to us through the Spirit. When you look in the Torah, wisdom, the word, chukmah, is used. When it's talking about the artisans who are making the tabernacle, the tent, who make the Ark of the Covenant, 
God says, I have given wisdom to so and so and to so and so and to so and so that they make these things according to my prescriptions, to my directions. So it's a very practical sense. There is very much external, oriented in this case towards making something. But as you go through the books, what we call the sapiential books of the Old Testament, the books that teach wisdom, Proverbs, Ecclesiasticus, Ecclesiastes, these books, they develop further so that from the Torah, you have the understanding that it is by observing the law that wisdom is given. You start moving in this direction. But in the sapiential books, it is also to recognize God and the power and the majesty and the goodness of God. So it's a much larger vision in moving us outward forward, not just in a pragmatic way, but moving us to see the goal and the end. And so you're taken through the old law, through the Old Testament, to a profounder understanding of the goodness of God, to live in the fear of the Lord, to keep the commandments. Our Lord echoes that today in the Gospel, which is just taken from the Last Supper. And there he winds up saying, but the one who observes the commandments that I give you, like I said, echoing from the very beginning of the teachings of the law, the Old Testament. But he adds the word love, that it's not just simply to observe them because you will find wisdom here, but you will find charity. And the charity, he says that when you keep these words, it shows that you love me. When you don't keep these words, it means you ignore me, you do not love me. But the one who follows these directives, who follows my commands, who loves me, my father will love him and I will love him and we will come to him and we will reveal ourselves. We will dwell with him. It's a very beautiful text, but our Lord is taking then this notion of wisdom from the pragmatic to the further idealization, if you want, to seeing even the personification of wisdom as being God in the book of wisdom itself in the old law. But that St. Paul is saying that this wisdom is something that is given to us internally to transform us from the inside out. It's not an external observance, but it is something that is given to us by this very spirit of God to transform and to bring us forward. So if you understand that, then you understand why this is the beginning of the letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are thinking they're hot stuff because they live at Corinth, just because of where they live. And he's saying, but that's not the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is what is given to the individual that transforms them inwardly, transforming their spirit from the inside out. And he says, if this wisdom had been present, then they would never have crucified our Lord. And that's why he does this whole contrast through the reading today that you can read. And again, I always encourage you to read these things in a quiet moment. He contrasts it and he says, in the powers of the world, the authorities, the government, they're all passing away. These things don't have value in themselves. This is why a fundamental reason why Christianity created a whole different, a whole parallel world. The Christians in the first three centuries are not trying to figure out how we make a pagan world acceptable to be Christian in. The Christians never think in that term, trying to make excuses for a pagan world. They simply create a world around our Lord. And it grows, and it grows numerically, and it grows. This is the kingdom. The kingdom has its own existence. The kingdom is not trying to figure out ways to sprinkle holy water on the pagan ways in the wisdom of this world. And so many modern Catholics never understand this. They're always trying to figure out some way that we can make the kind of pagan modern world not be so bad. And St. Paul says it's bad because it's blind, not because they're wicked or satanic. They're just blind. They don't know what they're doing. And if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had possessed this wisdom, they would not be apostatizing from the gospel. If they had had this wisdom, they would not slaughter human beings by the millions year after year in abortion. If they had this wisdom, they would see everything differently and order their lives accordingly. It's very logical. 
And so the Christians from the very beginning never tried to figure out a way to reconcile the pagans around them and the gospel because they didn't see it as being reconcilable. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of man are water and oil. They do not mix at all. And so the building of the kingdom, this isn't a pious, airy, fairy thing. The building of the kingdom is Christians redeveloping their entire relationships among themselves. And if pagans want to be brought into that salvation, that's what we want. Good, come into the salvation. It's not the church entering into the pagan world. It's the pagans finding the wisdom and the healing of God in adoration. This is a totally different vision. And this is why the church transformed human existence. It has transformed the planet. Even the pagan countries today have been transformed because of the gospel and the wisdom of God. Whether they want it or not, it's just what has happened in the world historically. And that's because the Christians in the beginning understood this. So when you understand this, then it makes much more sense why St. Paul is telling the Corinthians, look around you. There's no great birth, no great accomplishments. Not because he's trying to be mean to them. He's bringing them something that is true to understand. You are putting your value in an external thing that is not even yours, first of all. And second of all, does it mean anything? You can go to ancient Corinth now and go look at the piles of rocks that are there. This is why St. Paul mentions several times, at least two times in this part of the letter, of the powers of this world who do not understand the wisdom of God. And the powers of this world that are passing away, that are ephemeral. The word ephemeral means, ephemera in Greek means a day. They last for a day. That's what ephemeral is. It's just gone. And this is what we have to really come to understand as Catholics is that this transformation of the kingdom is not trying to make excuses for the pagan world. It's not trying to make excuses for the world itself, but it is to construct the kingdom. In the bulletin this week, we begin to start talking about the sacraments and faith. Last week, we conflicted upon the faith. What does faith actually mean? But the sacraments themselves are the very things in which God is adored and we are healed. They are the very things that construct this kingdom. They are the very thing that reworks human relations. They rework families. They rework relationships between friends, between colleagues, at a social level, at a family level, at an individual level. Everything is reworked, and they're reworked through the actions of God in the sacraments. At 11 o'clock, that's why this is set up, at 11 o'clock, we have another child who will be baptized today. Entering into the body of Christ, being engrafted into the kingdom. And this child will be carrying a torch, very likely at this point with our medical successes, very likely into the 22nd century as an old man. It's very possible. No reason why not. And what will the 22nd century look like when we already flounder so dismally in the 21st. But unless the Christians begin to appreciate what St. Paul is teaching about the wisdom of God, we will flounder and sink evermore. And we will not be the voices in the faith of salvation because we will not have shown that we actually believed in this wisdom in the first place ourselves. This is why when our Lord says that if the salt loses its savor, what is it good for? Nothing. It can't preserve anymore. It's just to be thrown away. And that is the tragedy when wisdom is lost. Again, it doesn't make the individual demonic, but it does put them on the demon's path. It doesn't make them satanic, but it does, to the degree that they lose the wisdom of God, does make them adversarial, which is what Satan means, adversary. And so we enter into, on this Sunday, following now these days of Pentecost, asking our Lord that he truly infuse with us this profound wisdom, not of pragmatism, not of prudence, not of pragma pragmatic calculations, but of a transformation of a vision. St. Paul and other places in his letters would say, this is the mind of Christ. This is the, you must put on the mind of Christ to see this glory and then order all things in your life towards this glory. That is the wisdom of God. 
May the Lord God infuse profoundly within our spirits his own divine spirit of who he is to transform our vision so that our hearts may be cleansed, our sins may be removed, and that our spirits be lifted into the Christ at the right hand of the Father. This is the creation of the kingdom that takes place through the sacraments. This is the kingdom which is God's wisdom on earth. May we be the full participants and even better communicators of it to others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
delight in the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude Thaddeus. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Page 754. 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, of love and faith that are pleasing to God.
peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. O Lord, we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy. Make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly, it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify, and proclaim.
remember your plan of salvation, and we ask you to have mercy on your worshipers and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, We, your sinful children, receive your graces. We thank you for the men because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. We walk in the Spirit from heaven. May these holy mysteries be before the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and for the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O oh Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith with blameless lives and with purity and holiness. May they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them, for you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen, the archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Jude Thaddeus, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, 
we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are thine now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el Kurchunna. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and with holiness, so that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial. Be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy God, one holy Son, one holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. A lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elokolechunna. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation, and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So there are two things to note. First of all, to wish an abundance of blessings upon all the fathers among us for having said yes to life and have brought, even more importantly, another generation into the kingdom of God. The second point is this coming Friday is the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And I forgot to make note as we are in the midst of the, of the fast of the Holy Apostles for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul and of the Holy Apostles on the 29th and 30th of this month, but I forgot to take note of the Nativity of John the Baptist and the Feast of the Sacred Heart this Friday, which would, according to our traditions, make a dispensation so that you can eat uh, fish and seafood on that day, this coming Friday, in the midst of the fast. Again, blessings upon all of the fathers. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen.